move on to uh, introducing Dr. Bob Mosignemi, and, and he's going to be talking about persistent um, Bartonella infections. And if you look at his biography, you know, he, he's historically a rheumatologist, worked at the NIH, um, has, has been the president of ILADS, um, has established his, his own, um, you know, uh, company, Galaxy Diagnostics. And and I and I think um, talking to you know to 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 to, to Bob, um, you know, when I first did this, Lyme disease was the first thing I thought of, and his 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 opinion, and may, maybe Bartonella is just as common or more common than Lyme disease and some of these syndromes. So, and I, and I'm not sure he isn't right. Um, so we'll we'll learn more on the next hour in his 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 presentation, Bartonella. Neurological and rheumatological manifestations of persistence. Thank you, Bob, for coming. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure uh, to be here and to give this talk. Um, uh, I've, I've come to Bartonella in a very roundabout way. I, I trained where they discovered Lyme disease, and ironically, maybe not so ironically, it was in a rheumatology department, not in an infectious disease department. At the time, I didn't realize um, the controversy and confusion and opportunity it would become. And then I went into rheumatology, vascular inflammation, vascular hemodynamics, and I started looking for reasons why patients might have vascular dynamic disorders. And then I came to Bartonella, which was then being co-associated with Lyme disease. So it's a very um, kind of roundabout, a circuitous route, but my focus has ended up being uh, the encephalopathic aspects of these infections. For disclosure, um, years ago, before um, Galaxy was even started, I collaborated in uh, what you might say was a prototypical One Health initiative with uh, Ed Reichberg, Professor Reichberg at NC State. And uh, they've been developing culture methods. Um, I won't get into this too far because it's just a disclosure, uh, but um, it's been a it's been a challenge to develop diagnostic tests uh, to help these patients. So I'll give you a bit of background, reservoirs and vectors, pathophysiology, uh, general mechanisms related to encephalopathy, collagen, vascular lymphatics. There's some new uh, links to cancer, uh, diagnostic testing, biofilms, um, direct indirect testing. How do you have proof that the microbe is there? Antibody testing is indirect. Uh, and some new interesting findings with RNA uh, and cytohybridization methods. And then finally, a word or two about treatment. If you look at publications on PubMed <clears throat> for Bartonella, this I just did last week. <clears throat> there um, is a huge jump uh, around 1990 to 91. And if you break it down uh, by keywords, Bartonella plus human gives you 3,300. <clears throat> Bartonella plus human plus disease, 2588. Bartonella, human disease, chronic, 169. But <clears throat> despite all that, we will see it when we believe it. <clears throat> Briefly, the pathogen uh, is a gram negative short chain market rod. It's a proteobacteria. Um, it has a very slow division time. So part of the reason this disease becomes so difficult to discern is that it's a it's so slowly moving, you can't necessarily see it happening. This is in sharp contrast to the patient who develops acute sepsis, right? And so in these persistent, slow, um, progressive states, uh, treatment also becomes difficult because invariably they worsen in some ways before they get better. Yet in some ways they also improve as other symptoms are worsening. There are many cellular targets. I think it's fair to say you can probably find this as an intracellular organism in, in any cell, probably. Um, there have been a bunch that where it's been well-documented, but I don't think it prefers to be inside the cell. Uh, 
Uh, when we do blood smears, for example, we usually see it on the outside of the cell. So we classically think of it as an intracellular pathogen, but it isn't necessarily so. Uh, lately, we've been having some luck with RNA probes, and we can find that when we look at a blood smear, there are groups of infected cells which tend to be uh, hanging out together. If you didn't stain these, you wouldn't necessarily discern that, in fact, the, the, the infected cells are aggregated. So, in a way, they travel together as a, a biofilm, or to think of it differently, uh, almost like a microembolism. It's another uh, view and just shows you the ability that we now have to resolve sing at the single cell level the metabolomics by looking at RNA uh, transcripts and ribosome RNA in particular. The vectors of Lyme, it's been debated as to whether Lyme is tick borne. Um, <clears throat> it, I think it can be. I'll go over that in a second. But in the history that we take, we, we must delve more into the risk factors around Varnella, for example, do they own a cat that is indoor and outdoor? They are, those patients, those owners of those cats are particularly high risk of Varnella. Cat scratch disease, to remind everyone, is from when uh, a flea-infested cat carries flea feces under the nail of the cat and they, they scratch and therefore inoculate the skin with the uh, Varnella from the feces of the flea. These pictures on the right are, with, are from my colleague, Martin Erickson, uh, who's a brilliant microscopist and uh, trying to have team together to try to understand the pathophysiology a bit better. So on the question of whether or not it's transmitted by ticks, uh, there's evidence that it, it is or can be. Um, and so I would say it's probably not the dominant form of transmission, but it probably, it probably can happen. <clears throat> I think that potentially any biting insect can uh, transmit it. Um, I've also had patients get uh, classic Lyme disease and ECM rash from a horsefly bite while jogging on a trail away from any wooded areas or tall grasses or anything. So I, I think we need to not think that these are exclusively transmitted by one insect or another. So this is from uh, Dr. Dehio, uh, but this is uh, a proposed infection strategy with an initial inoculation, and then there's a dermal phase. Uh, and in many patients, that dermal phase resolves, only sometimes to reemerge as you treat them. So they start developing this sort of uh, brownish, hyperpigmented, three to four centimeter round uh, lesion on some area of their skin. And when you ask them if they ever were bitten in that area, they then remember. So sometimes these um, dormant um, localized infections can emerge as you treat them. So the classic understanding of cascrack disease is stereotypically fever, lymphadenopathy, dermal rash, phase, <laughs> lymphadenopathy. And if you look at the textbooks, they will tell you that this is a self-remitting, resolving infection that doesn't need treatment. And at most, the patient might get a week or so of azithromycin. The new awareness is from many publications and case reports that uh, that the infection persists. Uh, it's an immunosuppressive infection. So in a way, it suppresses its own rash, its own, own lymphadenitis. And then eventually, the individual's immune system. So um, I always tell my patients, Barnell is immunosuppressive until you try to treat it. And then you get a rebound inflammatory response, which is a bit more than just a Herxheimer reaction. So the new awareness is that it can affect other parts of the body. It can uh, cause uveitis, especially during treatment, especially during treatment where you're using antibiotics that penetrate the eye, such as rifibutin. And historically, rifibutin has been associated with uveitis, but that's mainly, I believe, because it was being given to people with high risk factors. And I'll talk a bit about the trend, about why we think encephalopathy occurs with Barnum. So the pathobiology is that the transmission is potentially from ticks, but known from fleas and other vectors. Um, I even, uh, for a while, when I searched the FDA.gov website, I, the first article that came up was a safety hearing on allergen extracts from dust mites. And they noted that the dust mites contain Barnum. 
And then in the safety hearing transcript, they then said that it's probably fine because Barnell's a benign self-limiting problem. So it's been documented in dust, allergen extracts for immunotherapy. But I'm sure it's not infectious because I presume that they have disinfected or somehow neutralized the active microbes. But you wonder if you can't get Barnell antibodies from dust mite allergen therapy. Just a hypothesis. So there's a, a local spread to the link of the skin, the lymphatics, the vasculature, the endothelium. It affects the endothelium marrow and blood components. Um, it's collagen associated um, uh, infection with biofilms. You can culture it from non regional skin. Uh, there's inflammation affecting the aspects of immune function, it's immune suppressive with non specific IgM activation. And what's interesting about this is it can actually cause a false positive IgM to a Borrelia Western blot. And I think this is where it confuses the Lyme diagnosis. It's often negative on IFA uh, until months after treatment begins. So it persists to become an indolent, progressive multi system infection that affects different tissues and elicits a range of post responses. So, literally, I tell patients that there isn't a symptom it can't cause. But you also can't be sure that it's the only cause when you have so many different symptoms. So what distinguishes it, though, is that it may be varying and variable over time. And uh, there's a constellation of different symptoms. There's vascular inflammation and biofilms that impede the circulation. There are biofilms that line the blood vessels. Uh, one common biofilm that lines blood vessels to build from this plaque causing cardiovascular disease. And in general, these plaques are loaded with different microbes. They're literally biofilm communities. And so we actually know scientifically the vascular disease, classic vascular disease is a, a due to persistent biofilm and infection in the plaque. And many different things have been isolated from these plaques. And yet, um, even though you know, the most common, one of the most common diseases in humans is likely a chronic infection, we don't have a way to go about diagnosing and treating that other than to use sense when the artery is too narrow. So it can cause cognitive impairment and anxiety, dysbiosis, small intestine bacterial overgrowth is very common in these patients and their systems dysfunctions. So this requires a functional medicine approach to the management of the patient because there are borderline low-level irregularities in different functional systems, for example, the adrenal system. So because all systems are involved, it can be hard to see. And every, these two people are just seeing different aspects of the same, of the same process. So Barnella can be found in any area of skin and blood lymphatics, and it's safe to assume it can be anywhere in the body at different times. It can cause almost any symptom. There are direct effects and indirect effects. There are neurological uh, manifestations. Uh, the brain and the neurological system in general is a very, very sensitive way to kind of know that this infection is present. So I think getting good at the neurological exam, neurological history, um, the neurologists refer to the FIA findings as subcortical neurological findings, which I'll explain further down the road. Uh, and the peripheral nerves are also affected, and longer nerves more than short nerves. So typically, a patient with Bartonella or infectious or inflammatory neuropathy will have more or less symmetric, but not exactly symmetric, a lower extremity involvement. So those are the longest nerves. They're the largest target for a vascular inflammatory process. But unlike the classic toxic metabolic neuropathy, where it will be completely symmetrical, vascular inflammatory neuropathy will be somewhat uh, varying and will be somewhat asymmetrical. And this is a, a big clue and, and one of the key points distinguishing, for example, CIDP with other neuropathies. The neurological symptoms can be wide ranging. Uh, there are mood disturbances. Um, there's more of a, an activation state. There's more um, tendency to this, this poor cognitive function. So there's a combination of inability to process information together with agitation, which leads to rage. Uh, it can. Uh, neuroretinitis, headaches, um, 
tooth pain. It's really common for me to have a patient tell me between appointments that they their tooth hurt and went and got a root canal. And what I have found is this happens often during treatment. If I just have them wait, they don't need the root canal because the the, the dental vascular supply is a, is also um, is a watershed type of vascular supply. So there's one arterial coming into each root and one vein going out. So sometimes this can be an area. In contrast to my MD colleagues, my endodontist friend, uh, when I mentioned Barnell, I said, oh yeah, that's really common in our literature. I asked him why, he said, well, it's a, it's a known cause of, um, of small abscesses or, or cysts uh, at the bottom of the uh, tooth that read the root. So I was really surprised that the endodontist was more aware of this than my MD colleagues. Lymph node swelling, heel pain, shin pain, um, you know, patients want to try to diagnose definitively some infection based on symptoms. I think that's hard to do, um, but this is a common set of symptoms they describe. There's joint pain, but hardly ever in effusion. The There's large and extensive erythematous stria, tracts, and more. And the term we now like to use is Barnell associated cutaneous lesions uh, because they are very. The general lab presentations um, that you might be surprised at is that the CRP, the high sensitivity CRP is usually normal, but if the uh, PCR is positive and the IFA is negative, the average CRP tends to be a little bit higher, but not really high. Um, so that's kind of paradoxical because we use these as screening tests for infections. <clears throat> the sedimentation rate is almost always normal. Uh, if it's not normal, I think about something else going. Uh, there's mild leukopenia often, low neutrophil counts. Uh, this is uh, due to a process of mitosis, uh, neutrophil extracellular trap formation. Liver function tests may be slightly elevated. During treatment, um, both the neutropenia and the liver enzymes um, change, scaring doctors into stopping treatment, which should not be stopped because it resolves on its own without stopping treatment. And often IgM and Ig are positive and IgG negative on Borrelia, Western blots, and immunoblots. So because serology is indirect and reflects a host response, we, we really start have to be concerned, we really have to start getting away from it because it is not direct evidence of an infection. And historically, that's really all we've had to go by. Um, so a typical Barnella patient may well have a positive IgM Western blot, but their IgG Western blot or blot usually looks very clean. The IFA is negative in up to 20%. This is Barnella IFA on presentation. Uh, typically, it's the adults or older adults who've had it a long time. Children who have Barnella usually are positive on their antibodies. Now, from their IFA positive, the average C4A is higher. C4A is an indication of the complement cascade being activated uh, post antibody uh, binding. So, how did I end it up here? Um, so, my early work was in transplant immunology, molecular immunology, then internal medicine, rheumatology, and worked in a place where they discovered the Lyme disease. So, the idea of chronic Rheumatic disease is causing, being caused by chronic infections was kind of a given. Um, and then I, I delved into vascular inflammation, neurovascular dynamics, transplant and Doppler, where I learned that this technology of transplant Doppler is primarily a European neurologist uh, skill set. And we worked with uh, excellent uh, neurologists, uh, mostly in Germany. Uh, and through this, I learned this is the key point. I learned the neurological features of small vessel disease. And with that, I started looking at patients for causes. And, and then that led to a phone, a phone call to Ed Reicher that I thought would be a few minutes. And my first call with him lasted two hours. And that's how we then we launched into this um, journey of discovering Barnella and its relationship to these tick-borne diseases. Very briefly, um, what we were trying to do with transfer and is to identify a pattern of small vessel disease. And it turns out that there's a hemodynamic signature that goes along with every form of vascular um, or every form of cognitive impairment. 
uh, ranging from hydrocephalus to uh, dementia, sleep apnea. You can detect sleep apnea with this with this uh, technology in a patient while they're awake, you know, without a need for a sleep study. So we sought out to try to classify the different hemodynamic patterns and signatures. Um, and the, the quest was really to find a way to, a better way to look for small vessel disease in the brain. And I still think there's a lot of work to be done here. So all of this work with Ed Reichert um, started by him saying, hey, send some specimens, uh, we'll test them. And I figured I'm just going to keep sending specimens until he says stop. So we got to uh, about 296 patients, and of whom about 205 were women, 91 men. Most of them believe they had persistent Lyme disease. Um, they may well have had Lyme disease. Um, the CNS small vessel disease was, was, I was sorting them and prioritizing who I tested by their subcortical neurological exam. And um, they were, um, some of them, 41% were PCR positive, uh, and 62% or so were serologically positive. But none of them had, or, or very few of them, I should say, were positive by serology and PCR. So you can't rely on one method to, to diagnose these patients. And the title of the talk was interesting. So I, I also have um, Lyme Western blot data on these patients, but at the time I thought that would be too heavy a lift to try to get that published. So we just said that these were patients with persisting Lyme disease in Lyme endemic region. Uh, and we published it in the CDC's own journal, Emerging Infectious Disease. And uh, it was kind of interesting because the CDC's own department, uh, their own internal researchers, um, uh, had a little uh, little difficulty with the fact that we said it was from a Lyme endemic region. So. Uh, they came back and uh, had some questions, wanted to do research, operative collaboration, um, which ultimately never really happened. In these patients, uh, about 50%, well, actually, those, this is the breakdown of the symptoms. So, for those who said they had Lyme disease, uh, about 33% were PCR positive for Barnella. Those who reported some sort of psychiatric disorder was about 50%. And any neurological disorder at eighty five percent. So again, symptom breakdown in that cohort. So because it can affect any tissue and any any blood vessel or lymphatic, it can create many different symptoms. But the neurological symptoms um, are central, peripheral, autonomic, nervous system. So I think chronic fatigue, postural orthostasis, and tachycardia syndrome. Uh, can all be, you know, potentially uh, caused by this. Um, the um, the white matter in the brain doesn't have collateral flow. The gray matter does. So therefore, these are what we all just call subcortical disconnection syndromes because the the white matter is what connects the different parts. So the brain functions aren't well integrated, and they're a little bit slow. So their reaction time may be slow. But their their memories preserved, but their complex tasks are more limited. Their executive function is very poor because that involves uh, having working memory and being able to track uh, and and be able to sort, coordinate, reprioritize as you go through your life's activities. This is a nice summary of different neuropsychiatric manifestations. Um, I won't read them all to you, but this is a publication with many different case reports. Um, this is a, a patient who, um, in a way, social media became uh, famous. Um, this is a young uh, teenager who had been bitten uh, or scratched by a cat and had multiple um, hallucinations and sudden onset psychotic behavior. Uh, Dr. Bransfield and Dr. Uh, Rosalie Greenberg. Uh, um, Dr. Lewis, uh, Dr. Preicher, and myself were all involved in the care of this patient. And you may have seen on social media with the uh, the um, information about Swamp Boy. If you've heard that term where you can look it up, you'll uh, 
see a, a lot of very uh, nice information that was developed to try to explain this problem to the lay audience. So, as you'd imagine, he went through lots of different evaluations and hospitalizations. Finally, a serological test was positive, which in and of itself was unusual, but possibly because he was younger than uh, he was young enough to have a positive result. And so finally, through a combination of antimicrobial therapy, um, we um, were able to get him better, and he responded uh, eventually rather quickly. So these are the different medications he was on over this time. And uh, finally, um, and he was already getting better before I saw him, but I switched his rifampin to rifibutin, which has a much better tissue penetration. Uh, minocycline and chlorothromycin were the mainstay. And I was very much surprised to call them in a follow-up call maybe a month or two after that visit. And they said he was already dramatically improved. So he really, the stage was set, but then he accelerated his improvement. So unfortunately, one of the things that can happen, these patients with severe states is they just don't want to live. And um, despite our best efforts, um, they eventually find a way out. So this was a recent uh, case um, on the West Coast, a 27-year-old who became progressively ill over five years. Multiple medical evaluations, um, multiple diagnoses, psychiatric hospitalizations, serology often unrevealing. Uh, after several years in different serologies, finally they had a positive result, ironically, on a commercial Bartonella test, IFA, which is usually hardly ever positive. The hospital psychiatrist consulted with me at the father's request, the father's a physician. Uh, recommendations were made, the patient began to improve. I was really surprised that a psychiatrist in a state psychiatric facility was would be able to reach out uh, to even ask for direction and advice. But two weeks after discharge, he committed suicide. So with uh, Alan McDonald and Reuter and others, we're currently working this case up. And um, these are some slides that um, Dr. McDonald uh, put together. So this is a, a game sustain demonstrating clockwise Bartonella-like organisms in variable density uh, in these erythrocytes. And notice the erythrocytes are aggregating together. And I'll, I'll show you many more slides. We've seen this pattern over and over again, where the infected erythrocytes are together. Now, if this hadn't been stained, you wouldn't necessarily you wouldn't be able to tell that these red cells were aggregated. I'm not sure what links them together. It might be a, a surface charge alteration. Might be a change in the fossil lipid membrane components affecting the red cell surface charge. This is um, <clears throat> now this isn't the same case, but it prompted Dr. McDonald to go back and look at another suicide case from the East Coast um, and stain it for with the same stains, looking for Bartonella. At the time, he only looked for Borrelia, but he's finding it based on this first this recent case. Um, so this is in the amygdala um, showing vascular infection. And this is uh, Dr. Madal, please, um, is a, a neuron. Um, looks like it's in the, maybe the sheet. So we then uh, recently have been getting um, testing specimens from patients with PANS. Uh, this is a pediatric autoimmune encephalopathy that that is known for being associated for being associated with strep infections. And um, <clears throat> so, in looking at these patients, um, we looked at biofilms um, on the peripheral blood smear, and uh, we used molecular probes to explore the causes and composition of the biofilms. So, much to my surprise. Um, the, uh, the, the pediatric patients had much higher levels of biofilms than the typical adult patients. I still don't really understand why, um, but I think it's a combination of, of um, it's probably mostly related to bad diet. You know, it's, it's bad enough in kids, but when they get sick, it gets really bad. This is just a general uh, review of biofilms and their importance. Um, they're there is no test really for biofilms. We, we look at it by looking at peripheral blood. And this is just a, 
uh, an example I, I found on the web. Um, but these, this is a stain for fibrin. So what's important about this is that this arterial, when inflamed or infected, will have fibrin deposits. There'll be flow impairment, and if on no other basis, just flow impairment alone can give you symptoms. So in the brain, where the white matter doesn't have collateral flow, this becomes this process becomes very significant, and results in a subcortical disconnection syndrome. So again, any symptom is possible, but each alone is not diagnostic. It's the pattern. So hopefully with with machine learning, we'll get better pattern recognition, and this will allow us to kind of break through this diagnostic, this clinical diagnostic um, complexity. So this is a patient who, uh, at the age of 14, came to see me. Uh, you didn't need a microscope to see this biofilm in the blood. Um, and we looked at um, increasingly large numbers of uh, Bartonella patients, um, and we found that uh, of all of the specimens referred, about 55% were positive for Bartonella. Um, there, we saw Bartonella and biofilms at a high level in about 56%. Um, and so, in general, um, the, the whole idea of CANS, I think, is, is much more than just strep. I think there's biofilm production for whatever reason, and then there are microbes that will see that strep is common in children. So it wouldn't be surprising that they would tip over and get worse if they had an underlying process going on, and then strep occurred. And the strep ended up becoming part of the biofilm and driving a chronic inflammatory response. We looked at um, some of these biofilms uh, that we find usually in the puppy coat. And we stained it for RNA uh, fish, for RNA lohensley, and we, of course, uh, see some positive uh, signal there. So um, you can think of biofilms as, uh, as a community of microbes. They have their own dynamic, they, they produce factors that they use, there's a certain symbiosis um, that may occur. And this is another you know, cutting area, cutting edge area of medical um, of science. This is a, a biofilm on a, another blood smear. Um, you can see the um, kind of light colored uptake of the RNA fish probe. And it's most intense in the area just at the edge of the uh, the, the whole biofilm and the surrounding abnormal red cells that are adherent. Just again to show you how we can now visualize directly these infections. So this is uh, published uh, by Dr. Um, Raoul's lab where they looked at um, infected erythrocytes, Bartonella infected erythrocytes, uh, and again the uh, and this is, I believe, immunostained, um, but the uh, barnal are, are infected cells are aggregated. This is one just in one of our patients, just a regular blood smear. Uh, and again, you see this sort of haze and then these red cells that clearly have these intra-RBC inclusions. Um, and again, this whole thing is, is, is sticking together. It's almost like a, a microembolism. So you can see how microvascular perfusion would be substantially uh, impaired. Uh, this is some nice in vitro work uh, looking at the growth of Barnella and finding that uh, a constitutive um, uh, protein that A expression is associated with biofilm formation in Barnella. Um, so again, we're, we're getting better at uh, understanding the biology, not just Barnella, but, but it's biofilm production. Um, so now I'm going to start transitioning to showing you some pictures of its of Barnella and collagen, and then, uh, and then on the lymphatics, and try to tie that back into encephalopathy. So my colleague uh, Martin Erickson using a very um, interesting and advanced microscopy techniques. Uh, um, she found. Uh, these areas of, um, of uptake um, of Bartonella. And, and you can see they're also 
growing in fibrin. The kind of pink magenta color here are the collagen fibers. And um, if you look carefully where there's Bartonella growth, that those collagen fibers appear to have been dissolved or transected or cut, which I think leads to a hypothesis about why we get these stria distense, these uh, Gareth Emetis uh, stretch marks. So these tracks are, they're not just three. A dermatologist will write them off as, oh, they're just, you know, stretch marks related to growth or obesity. And while that is certainly something that can happen, I, we believe that this is much more than that. Um, the skin collagen fibers are weakened. And so those normal tensile forces that operate on the skin seem to create a, a more um, intense uh, pathological feature. Um, so they're usually, um, usually um, severe, they're erythematous. The erythema clears when you start treating them with antibiotics and eventually just fades into the background like an old scar that you can't visualize. Uh, they are somewhat asymmetric, um, but they can be on both sides. Um, they can be extensive um, along the waist, under the arms, behind the knees. Um, and there's a interesting correlation where, especially in the pediatric or teenage population, when you see neuropsychiatric symptoms, you will often see these uh, unusual stretch marks too. This is a uh, in a young male who's growing in height rapidly vertically, you can also get them horizontally on the back. And this is a, another patient of mine who, at the time he became sick, he wasn't overweight. Um, and some of these you can see in his um, mid back there, in the flank there, they're not, um, they're not typically what you'd expect to stretch more. Um, this young man, unfortunately, uh, developed lower extremity paresis. And what's interesting is he has reflexes, but he can't control. He can barely activate the muscles in his lower extremity. And, and we still haven't figured out a lesion in his case. And when you biopsy these, uh, we, we typically biopsy in the lesion and just outside the lesion. So lesional and non-lesional and both are positive for Bartonella. So this normal appearing skin has it too, uh, but it's at a much lower density. So the non-lesional skin, that's what the normal collagen whorls uh, look like. And the lesional skin, the collagen, the structure is highly damaged. Uh, on skin biopsies, we can sometimes uh, get lucky enough to visualize a um, blood vessel. And in this case, we actually saw uh, uptake uh, in kind of a vascular pattern. Um, so there's an example of an arterial, probably, or a capillary even that's infected. Now, if the collagen whorls are damaged, um, what else can happen? Um, so this was a patient who we reported as a uh, case of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, type three. She was diagnosed as having that by an EDS expert, Dr. Frank Romano in Baltimore. And um, she didn't have this growing up, but she had grown up with three infested cats and became, and didn't get enough of it. So she became a veterinary dermatologist. So she had multiple and extensive exposures to, um, to uh, flea infested cats and Bartonella and we isolated multiple um, Bartonella species um, by PCR. This is uh, Dr. Breitschwert's uh, lab at NC State. And um, in her case, the, she was negative for antibodies this was uh, May 2010. Antibiotics were started in August. Sorry about the dark time. Uh, she started getting some CNS improvement um, around September, and that's when the antibody local spikes uh, began to spike. So around October to November, this is uh, about 11 months or so after starting antibiotic therapy, her titers went from zero to uh, above the uh, 
at the top of the scale of about one to 512. And then uh, we had this window where they went negative again. So I believe this is where we may get antigen antibody precipitation, immune complex formation. This phenomenon has been well described in the literature, it's well known. Uh, so it, this just points out why serology is highly unreliable if you're trying to diagnose these infections. This is a test, serology is a test that has a, a completely different meaning before you begin treatment than it does during treatment, than it does in the middle of treatment, than it does after treatment. So it's if you're looking for clues, it may help you, but once you, you have it, um, you, you know, you can't do much of it. If I have a patient who's negative at the start, I will test it every month until I see a good, solid, positive response. And then I, I stop testing until the very end of treatment when I want to establish their new baseline for the future. And she had molecular isolates for Bartonella Benzoni Burkhoffi, type 1, type 2, type 3, Bartonella Hensley, and Bartonella Cholerae. Now, in one of her appointments, she asked me, if I thought the Varnella could cause her hypermobility syndrome. And I thought, and I had taken, I had learned just enough immunology to know that sometimes with the right cytokine signals, fibroblasts and macrophages are interchangeable in terms of their function. So I thought, aha, uh -huh, maybe this is the mechanism. I said, sure, yeah, I think it's plausible. And that was the first time uh, anyone asked that question. But she, she came in with um, wraps around her elbows and her wrists. She was about to have surgery for. Uh, Probably for lots of uh, elbow and wrist subluxations, and she ultimately didn't have to have that those operations. So I showed you the collagen and the skin lesions, um, but what about the capillaries? So the capillaries are highly affected um, in these lesions. Um, these little uh, white spots are all uh, Bartonella immunoreactivity. Uh, is much less of it in the less affected or non lesional uh, tissue. Uh, in the control dermis, this is what the lymphatic would look like. In a patient with Bartonella, this is what the lymphatic looks like. It's highly branched without Bartonella induced uh, endothelial growth factor production. Um, and so we know that it damages the lymphatics. Uh, in fact, classically, you think of cast brush disease as. Infection is skin tracking up the lymphatics into the lymph nodes. And historically, it's been thought of as just like a lymph node based uh, infection. So, a few years ago, we learned that there was uh, an equivalent lymphatic uh, system in the brain, and it's called the glymphatic system. So, given the pictures I showed you of the brain amygdala, the vasculature, and knowing what we see in the lymphatics in the skin. Uh, it, it is a virtual certainty that it's going to affect brain lymphatics also. So the evidence is really building strongly toward uh, these mechanisms of encephalopathy um, for Barnell. Um, so I, I touched on this before, um, but the peripheral nerves are dependent on the epineural vasculature and the central nervous <laughs> system and why matter is a watershed area. So general memory is preserved, but reaction time, executive function are impaired. Um, other features of a good subcortical neurological exam um, would be um, uh, psychotic intrusions on smooth pursuit, ask them to follow your finger. And if as they do so, the eye movement is stuttering, that's called a psychotic intrusion. So again, if you, it's not, it's very easy to examine a patient for this, but it's a, it's another good sign of, um, of the, uh, a perfusion deficit. They can also have, um, the, the pupils may react to light at a different rate. And that's because the sympathetic ganglion that goes up to the eye that regulates that may be selectively injured on one side versus another. So they can have an asymmetrical pupillary reaction time. So if it can affect the small vessels, where, what symptom, where, where did it not go? Uh, and the answer is really, it can be anywhere. Um, from the brain, it can cause ischemia reperfusion injuries. Um, you can get uh, stunned or idling neurons. 
Uh, if they're infarcts, usually they're very small. These patients aren't striking out all the time, but they can have transient ischemic episodes. And in a healthier, younger patient, these can usually be overcome. They may get a, a migraine attack because it has to be compensatory vasodilation to reroute the, uh, the blood flow. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the neurological manifestations, um, again, uh, peripheral neuropathy, uh, executive dysfunction, I'm just uh, repeating some of this for emphasis. Um, it's important to remember it's not a dementia. Um, the working memory can be impaired. The processing speed is delayed. The mood is labile. And um, in the peripheral um, nervous system and other peripheral um, systems, um, you can get a migratory neuropathy. Um, uh, you can get itching. Uh, there's endothelial dysfunction, which then, uh, and that affects the, uh, the dynamic component of vascular tone and can be uh, it can be a cause of uh, POTS, or postural orthostasis and tachycardia. Um, it can cause muscle pain, myocarditis, um, joint pain, headaches, fatigue. Now, when fatigue is present, uh, we should be thinking more about the visa. And uh, decreased circulatory efficiency would decrease stamina, physiologically. Stamina, uh, VO2 probably drops. Um, I wish there was a more convenient way to measure that regularly in patients, because that might be a good way to tell uh, how the small vessel disease is, was progressing. There are some potential cancer links that are emerging. Um, I, you know, this is all preliminary, but in the study my colleague Martin Erickson uh, had done, they co-cultured um, malignant melanoma cells. Uh, this uh, Mo surgeon. Paul Reichardter in the US Midwest uh, was seeing an unusual number of patients with malignant melanoma. Given the bacterial association with dermal niche and clinical suspicion, he set up to determine if they had evidence of Barnella. Uh, these uh, patients uh, were tested. These are the serologies, and some of them were, in fact, positive for Barnella instead of IPCR. The um, tissues were uh, immunostained. Um, and uh, the uh, immunoreactive Bartonella co localized with immunoreactive uh, VEGF C vascular endothelial growth factor type C. Um, the co culturing allowed the Bartonella to enter the melanoma cell cytoplasm uh, and the change in the shape and the VEGF C production and increased interleukin 8 production. And um, this is a great 3D view that uh, Dr. Erickson put together to show you um, Right, that was going very slowly, so uh, <laughs> there you go. <clears throat> so the um, the red is the bright line inside the um. Uh, the melanoma of the cell culture cells. Yeah, the computer is rendering it a bit slowly. So I'll move on. The point is that we can now visualize um, these morphologically inside the cell. So when co-cultured with Barnella, the, um, the veg of um, production increased and it increased at a faster rate on a kinetic uh, basis. So, um, and because VEGFC is a melanoma growth factor, um, this is uh, preliminary data that a Bartonella infection can at least accelerate uh, the melanoma spread. Uh, 
but again, preliminary data. Um, uh, if we have time, I'll show you um, some preliminary data that uh, my uh, white colleague, Dr. Uh, Neil Spector, had begun to look at by co-culturing breast epithelial cells with Bartonella and finding that, that it was a potent inducer of oncogenes. So for testing for persisters, what are the points to learn? Remember, the, the testing breaks down to direct testing and indirect. Antibodies are indirect testing. You're looking at the host response. These, um, even Pasteur and Beauchamp uh, debated whether or not it was the bug or the terrain that caused disease, but really, I think mostly it's the way the host responds that creates the, the disease. Um, the um, molecular tests are what we typically refer to as direct tests. Uh, Immunohistochemistry can be uh, a direct test. Um, and then a nucleic acid testing. So we have PCR. Digital PCR overcomes, to some degree, overcomes the intrinsic inhibitors. Uh, sequencing, next-gen sequencing, PacBio. Um, these typically aren't more sensitive than PCR. Um, and then there's fish, and in particular, RNA fish. Since RNA is the most prevalent nucleic acid, especially ribosomal RNA, it, it's a good target for, um, for, for developing sensitive assays. And it also gives you uh, a glimpse of the metabolomics. So uh, when we do an RNA fish probe, we're, we're getting a stronger signal from cells that have more like acid, more RNA. The um, molecular methods um, uh, are, again, PCR, fish, um, combining fish with imaging. Um, you know, PCR is rapidly advancing, but please be aware that a negative PCR does not rule out an infection. Negative sequencing results do not rule out an infection. It all depends on an adequate number, amount of nucleic acid. So if you have a septic patient and you order a sequencing study, that could be quite helpful. But if you're looking for low level persisters, uh, don't, don't consider a negative result. Don't, don't consider evidence of absence. Um, antibodies, the caveat is host response issues, um, and they're not necessarily specific, um, especially IgM. IgM is intrinsically not a specific antibody. I think the value of IgM in a chronically infected patient is just about zero, other than to tell you that there's a chronic, persistent, inflammatory state. Uh, so know the laboratories, uh, what their capabilities are, uh, the commercial tests. Um, you know, in the U.S., to have a commercial test, you have to have it go through a certain validation and or even FDA approval if they're trying to sell a kit. But once that is done, that technology is locked down. They're not allowed to change it, which means they're not allowed to improve it unless they go back to a whole other submission. So a kit that a commercial lab uses to do a Bartonella assay is kind of technology frozen in time and not recently uh, developed. Uh, know the options and caveats. Serology is highly variable. As I discussed, clinical response can be misleading because patients will often get worse before they get better. And molecular testing provides direct evidence for infection. Uh, antibodies for Bartonella may be falsely negative, 20% of presentation, if long-standing duration of infection. Most of these uh, serenative patients become positive during treatment. Uh, culture is possible, but requires a specialty lab. Any PCR result should be sequenced for specificity. So if I get a positive PCR, my first question is, did they sequence this? Uh, it's cheap to sequence it. it it's, it's, uh, this should always be done, in my opinion, if it's a positive result. Um, these methods are advancing rapidly. Uh, the problem fundamentally is that there are a lot of inhibitors and they need to do enough to uh, get enough nucleic acid and to expose the, the target sequences properly for application. Um, and uh, testing of blood and skin is under study. Uh, we, um, have had some patients who have been uh, often negative on blood fish, RNA fish for Barnella three times in a row. And this is after extensive treatment for Barnella. And then on a skin biopsy, which was done because the person has severe neuropathy, we, we saw loads of Barnella that were positive. 
So the question of when your treatment is over is guided partly by blood testing, but ultimately we think it's going to require a skin biopsy or two. And of course, we can never biopsy the entire patient. <laughs> so I think it's a given that there's probably some residual infection, no matter how well you treat it. And, but it can be kept at a level that's low enough to allow the person to be in health and good health. So this is an interesting, a very interesting case. Um, <clears throat> this is a patient with hypermobility. She has a kind of tall aesthetic physique that's often associated with uh, Ehlers-Danlos and hypermobility. That also goes with vessel activation, which she had proven on GI biopsy and IHC staining for CD117. She had diffused severe bilateral lower extremity erythema consistent with the venous stasis pattern. At COVID-19 and recovered <laughs> without complication. Um, and uh, the diagnostic testing was positive for Barnella, IFA strongly positive, molecular imaging positive, skin biopsy positive. So on the left panel, we see the results of um, blood RNA fish for Barnella. And on the right, uh, Babesia. So she's co-infected also. In Babesia, we, we see, it's a little hard to show, I should have um, zoomed in, but we, we often see, um, we often see pairs uh, and sometimes in the extracellular space, we see tetrads. So what we're taught of as being the most common form, a tetrad within a red cell, uh, we find that's not the most common form. We, we see tetrads more often in the extracellular space. And we, the most common form we see are these pairs, these doublets of uh, uptake um, uh, just right on the, the red cell, which has been described as the accolade uh, position. This is the skin biopsy of the patient. She had this erythema in the lower extremities, but this all, this bright uptake in the um, in this very thin kind of dermal layer um, is uh, is Bartonella. Now we we looked at her nerve, her skin biopsy for nerve injury, and um, um, just to remind everyone, these are the, the components of these uh, neurons, and we um, recently developed an assay for to show. Um, by confocal microscopy, nerve demyelination. And when I saw this for the first time, I realized why demyelination is associated with pain. So you have the, um, in the magenta here, you've got the non myelinated slow nerve fibers carrying pain signals, heat, and cold signals. And then the myelinated fast nerve fibers carry touch, vibration, proprioception, motor signals. So if you look at these, Areas you see there's been substantial demyelination. And, um, and so you can see how there could be an electrical short circuit literally from the myelinated fibers to the non-myelinated pain fibers because they're they're right next to each other. So for example, from this little non-myelinated point here, uh, you can get a, a signal potentially transferred into the uh, non myelinated, the myelin to non myelinated. Now, in the next step, we're going to start looking at these regions uh, for a few things. One is uh, these areas are thought to be higher in density with mitochondria, which has its own interesting implications for inflammation and for repair. Um, and then look to see, we haven't done this yet, to look to see if there's a barnella also associated with these or any other micro. So a couple of uh, slides on treatment considerations, and then we'll be done. So again, remember this is an intracellular pathogen that may be widely distributed with the tissues. Oral antibiotics can work. I, I strongly uh, urge you to avoid intravenous therapy, except when the gut can't tolerate it. Uh, you have to choose antibiotics that do penetrate intracellularly. Uh, the antibiotics are bacterostatic, not bacterocidal. So it takes time for the immune system to clear the infection once the microbes metabolism is suppressed. 
The biofilms and tissue cysts may play a role in the persistence of the infection. Inflammation worsens always in association with treatments. While some symptoms improve, others are worsening. And you have to do a lot of uh, hand holding, a lot of motivational speaking, a lot of encouragement to, to have the patient go through it. And most importantly, you have to have the confidence yourself that this will happen. When I started treating these patients, we didn't know. I didn't have the confidence. So I, I felt very anxious about, I, I didn't want to give the patient false assurance. But over time, I learned, I've been doing this for almost 15 years. And over time, I learned that, in fact, that they, they do recover. Um, the inflammation flare-up typically begins about seven days after treatment has started. I don't start double antibiotic therapy right away. Initially, it's berthromycin, and I wait a few weeks, then I add berthampin, um, and then kind of go from there. Uh, but typically, the symptoms start to develop the Herxheimer response around seven days, but it tends to peak around 14 to 21 days, and then slowly fades. So you have to treat in a stepwise manner, um, and uh, the, um, the the classical recommendation, which I'm not recommending, is that you know patients with like cast infections, these just get one week of azithromycin. Uh, it's probably just enough to suppress it and make it dormant. Uh, the conventional approach of doxine or fampin, uh, the fampin part, I think, is helpful. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Breitschert, please, in the veterinary population, <clears throat> to quote, you can soak a dog in a tub of doxycycline and it won't touch the Bartonella. And so we don't think doxycycline is, is helpful for Bartonella. It may be anti inflammatory, and it's a mitochondrial ribosome inhibitor. <laughs> So in the veterinary world, quinolones are used uh, a lot. I don't recommend them because uh, they're going to have joint pain and then you're going to be confronted with uh, Achilles tendonitis and joint pain. Uh, some recent practice patterns are emerging using a erythromycin in combination with rifampin. If you're using rifampin, remember it's a liver CYP inducer. So if there are other drugs, the drug levels will go down. Their cortisol levels will go down if they're very sick and they're hormonally depleted. You will make them much worse when you give rifampin. A healthy patient can tolerate rifampin, but a uh, sick patient will have a hard time. So really understand the cytochrome pathways, what it does to other medications, hormones, and rifibium uveitis um, is something to be really careful about. Um, I'd be happy to talk to people afterward about that. So. With great thanks and gratitude to all these team members and more, and of course the patients, um, thank you for your attention. So before we wrap up, I do have one question. Yeah. How sure. long do you treat? Uh -huh. How long is a piece of strength? Uh, Six months, 12 months, 18 months? It, it, it gets closer to 12 months. Yeah, it's about a month or so of erythromycin, then adding rifampin to and ramping up the doses as they tolerate it. So you usually hit your full stride with full treatment at about three to six months into it, depending on how sick they were initially. With teenagers, you can go a lot faster. Sometimes they'll bounce back within a month or two. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.